Hello, my name is Mustafa and I'm a medical doctor and this is a high quality free medical online resource for learning nephrology. Please like this video so it reaches more people and here we will talk about the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. So this is one of the diseases that lead to nephrotic syndrome and here we will explain it. So let's start with terminology. Uh, so let's explain the term focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. So the focal means when doing a biopsy, there is less than 50% of glomeruli involved. So it means the disease doesn't affect the whole kidney, it just affects a focus of the kidney. So less than 50% of glomeruli are involved. Segmental means portion of the glomerulus is involved. Other are normal. So when you examine the glomerulus under a microscopy, you find out that a part of the glomerulus is involved. Other parts are normal. Glomerulo means glomerulus and sclerosis means scar. So the whole term means uh, less than 50% of glomeruli are scarred. Now let's talk about an overview of the disease. So FSGS is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in adults. Because remember, in children, the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome was the minimal chain disease. So in adults, it is the FSGS, in children is the MCD. The FSGS is the second most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children. So it affects all uh, ages, it affects children and adults, and it's the most common cause in adults, and it is the second most common cause of, of nephrotic syndrome in children. The FSGS is common in people of West African descent, the primary genetic type. So FSGS has two types, primary and secondary. The primary one is more common in the West African descent people. The FSGS is famous for causing damage to transplanted kidney in less than 24 hours. And minimal change disease and FSGS are on the same spectrum of podocyte injury. So they both affect the photoprocesses of the podocytes. The MCD is mild injury to the podocyte, while the FSGS is severe injury. And the FSGS has poor prognosis compared to the minimal change disease, which has a good prognosis because the, the FSGS is resistant to steroids, as we will uh, explain later in this video, while the MCD is very sensitive to steroids and people tr get treated with the steroids easily. Now let's talk about the etiology. So we mentioned earlier that we have a primary FSGS and secondary FSGS. The primary one is on two types. There's the idiopathic and there is the genetic or familial type. While the secondary one, it is secondary to HIV, sickle cell anemia, drugs like pamidronate and heroin, and it is secondary to massive obesity, and it is secondary to renal injury, for example, renal injury from hemolytic uremic syndrome, and it is secondary to systemic disease. Now let's explain the pathogenesis of the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. So in the primary type of FSGS, there is injury to the podocyte due to a circulating toxin. So there is unknown circulating toxin that lead to the injury to the podocyte and lead to the primary type of the FSGS. This, the secondary type of FSGS uh, has different pathogenesis according to different uh, causes of the secondary one. So if the secondary FSGS is secondary to reduced renal mass, secondary to sickle cell disease, or secondary to obesity, uh, this lead to increased glomerular capillary blood pressure. Those, those diseases lead to increased capillary blood pressure, which lead to hyperfiltration through the glomerulus and subsequent podocyte injury. So if the patient has reduced renal mass or sickle cell, because remember with the sickle cell, there's a lot of thrombosis uh, and blocked vessels, and with the obesity, there is a lot of mass that, uh, that compress the body organs. So this would lead to increased the glomerular capillary blood pressure, and it would lead to hyperfiltration through the glomerulus 
and this hyperfiltration leads to subsequent polycyte injury. If the secondary FSGS is secondary to HIV or drugs like heroin or pamidronate, then there is a direct injury to the polycyte either by the virus, so either by the HIV virus or by the drug. So the drug, the drug or the virus would injure the polycyte directly and lead to cyclorosis and the FSGS disease. If we take a renal biopsy from a patient with FSGS, we find out that the light microscopy shows segmental sclerosis. And this is opposite to the minimal change disease because in minimal change disease, the light microscopy and the immunofluorescence both normal. But here the light micro microscopy would show segmental sclerosis and the immunofluorescence would show deposition of C3 complement and IgM antibodies in the area of the scar in the glomerulus. And electron microscopy would show effacement of the photoprocesses, same with the minimal change disease. So they both in electron microscopy would show effacement of photoprocesses. And since FSGS is focal, affecting less than 50% of glomeruli, the abnormality may not show on renal biopsy because we might not take the biopsy with, uh, with the damage. We might take a normal uh, renal biopsy and it would be normal leading to initial diagnosis of MCD, minimal change disease. This is a simple drawing for you to understand the FSGS easier. So here we have the filtration barrier between the blood and urine. So on this side we have the blood and on this side we have the urine. And here we have the filtration barrier that the blood will filtrate through it. Uh, so this is here the capillary of the glomerulus and between, uh, between that we have the pores. From those pores the blood particles would go through that and here we have the glomerular basement membrane and the last part is the bodocytes. Here we have multiple bodocytes on this side. And this is the filtration slits between the bodocytes here. So what happened in FSGS is that we have a circulating toxin that would damage the bodocyte photoprocesses here. So it would damage these areas of the bodocytes making the filtration slits between the bodocyte are bigger than normal, allowing proteins to go through the pores and into the filtration slits and out to the urine. And this led to proteinuria and the other symptoms. And on this slide, we will explain the pathophysiology of the FSGS. So FSGS lead to proteinuria, as we mentioned, which is also frothy urine, and this would decrease the serum protein because the proteins are coming from serum and into the urine and they are lost through urine. Uh, and one of the proteins are lost is the immunoglobulins. Those uh, globulins are related to immunity and once they are decreased in quantity, this would make the individual more susceptible to infection. So they might present to you with infection. Another protein lost is the coagulation factors and the anticoagulation factors. One of the, these anticoagulation factors is the antithrombin-3. This factor is responsible for deactivating the active form of factor 2, factor 9, factor 10, factor 11, and factor 12. And if this is lost, this would make the individual more susceptible to thrombosis. And as a reaction uh, of decreasing the serum protein, the liver would react by producing more proteins and lipids to replace the, the lost ones. And this would lead to hyperlipidemia and fatty casts. And another major protein that is lost is the albumin. So this would lead to decrease its level when it is lost in urine. And as we know, the albumin is and other proteins form the oncotic pressure. So when the albumin is lost, the oncotic pressure decreases. And remember that we have two types of pressures. We have the hydrostatic pressure and we have the anchotic pressure. Uh, and both those control the circulation. The hydrostatic pressure is produced by the heart by bumping the blood in the vessels 
It produces the hydrostatic pressure, while the anchoric pressure is formed by the proteins, as we mentioned, and the anchoric pressure is responsible for keeping the blood inside the circulation. And once this pressure is lost, the anchoric pressure, the, the blood can't stay in the circulation, and this would lead to the fluid being shifted from the intravascular and into the tissues, which lead to edema. And because of the fluid shifting, this would lead to decreasing the intravascular fluid or the intravascular volume. And in response to that, when the volume is lost from the, inter from the intravascular space, this, this made the kidneys react by activating the runny angiotensin aldosterone system. This system is responsible for returning the volume back to the circulation by bringing more wa water and sodium so it leads to sodium and water retention and this leads to hypertension and more edema. So in FSGS relapse, you would see that the patient may, be, uh, in may have infection, may have thrombosis, may have hyperlipidemia or fatty casts, and most importantly, all of them would have hypertension and edema. And that brings us to the presentation of the FSGS. The primary FSGS typically present with acute fulminant nephrotic syndrome. Same with minimal change disease. So basically, the patient would present to you with edema, they present with hypertension. All the features would be present in these patients. The secondary FSGS, on the other hand, is mostly asymptomatic with nephrotic range of proteinuria or below that without hypoalbuminemia or edema. So basically, in the secondary FSGS, there is less protein lost compared to the primary one. And this would make uh, the body can adapt to that uh, changes, and this would make the secondary FSGS more asymptomatic, and the patient would be asymptomatic for the most part. Now, during an FSGS relapse, the patient present with frothy urine, Pitting edema, which is worse in lower extremities, and very orbital edema, like this uh, kid here. It, the, the outer of the eye would be uh, swollen. They might also present with abdominal pain due to ascites, severe hypovolemia, peritonitis, pancreatitis, thrombosis, or st steroid-induced gastritis. And they also present with hypertension, and the patient may develop white nails, sometimes in bands, which are called the murky lines during relapses. Like that, the nail would, be, uh, would have bands, and between the bands are white areas, which is, uh, and those nails are called the murky nails. The adults may develop xanthomas and xanthelasmas because of the hyperlipidemia. Now let's talk about the diagnosis. So we would find above the nephrotic range of proteinuria, the urine dipstick would show three pluses or four pluses. The 24 hours urine protein is more than 3.5 grams. The urine protein creatinine ratio of more than three. And the comprehensive metabolic panel would show low serum albumin less than three. We do renal function tests looking for renal dysfunction, which include the blood urea nitrogen and the creatinine. And the serum electrolytes looking for calcium and other electrolyte changes because total serum calcium and vitamin D decrease due to decreased protein bound calcium and decreased vitamin D binding proteins lost in urine. So when those proteins are lost, the vitamin D would be and the calcium would uh, change, the values would change and the NS calcium is usually normal. There is mild hyponatremia during relapses, elevated hemoglobin and hematocrit levels and thrombocytosis are usually found during relapse as a result of the plasma volume contraction and confirmatory test as we mentioned with renal biopsy. Now let's move to talking about the treatment of the primary focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. So the primary FSGS may respond to high dose glucocorticoids therapy which is from 0.5 to 2 milligrams per kilograms per day. But the response 
is not as fast as in the minimal change disease because remember the FSGS is more resistant to steroids. Calcineurin inhibitors like tacrolimus, cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate mofetil, sometimes used but their efficacy is variable. And progression to chronic kidney disease is common in patients who don't respond to glucocorticoids and disease occurs after renal transplantation. The treatment of the secondary FSGS is that you treat the causes, the secondary causes, and for both of these diseases, the primary and secondary FSGS, you use a supportive therapy, you use strict blood pressure control, should be less than 130 over 80, using ACEs or ARPs, hyperlipidemia treated with statins, edema treated with sodium restriction and diuretics, thrombophilia treated with anticoagulation, and infection treated with antibiotics. Finally, let's talk about the complications. So the kidney failure is a common long-term complication among the FSGS patients. Untreated cases all progress to end-stage kidney disease except for less than 10% of them. And with that, we reach the end of this video. Thank you guys for watching. Please make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support us more, you can by subscribing to the Patreon. Link provided in the description of this video. Thank you for watching and peace.